Hi, and welcome back. My name is Mandy Johnson. I'm a physical therapist and athletic trainer. And over in the next screen next to me, whichever, if that's your right, my left, um, is Miss Tammy Miller. And she is an expert in nutrition, uh, chemistry, and all things related therein. Um, we are coming to you today to talk about inflammation and arthritis, which are two very scary words that you like to see, like that you see on normally Facebook ads or other mm -hmm. you know, little ads off to the side that you know show you that Google Analytics is working great. Um, but <laughs> um, but the whole point is that those those two things, um, and I'm sure Tammy will talk about the inflammation aspects more, are really um, kind of normal parts of what our body does. Mm -hmm. um, now, it, inflammation, I'm sure Tammy will get into that, can be controlled most likely a little bit more. Arthritis is actually something that uh, will happen regardless. So a lot of people come into the clinic and they're just devastated, and I'm serious, like devastated that their doctor told them they have arthritis. And what their doctor also failed to mention is that arthritis starts around the age of 25. You know, if you took an x-ray of the average 25 year old, the neck, low back, for sure they're gonna show signs of arthritis. You know, people will also talk about, um, oh, you know, I have arthritis because I played football or I have arthritis because I did volleyball. Um, and true you, they have arthritis and maybe it's a little bit different than it would have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. But honestly, um, there's not a lot of research to back up. You know, if someone was really super active and played D1 ball or went to the NFL, or the NHL, that that person is going to be horribly arthritic and barely can walk in their 80s compared to someone that basically just, you know, worked a nine to five job and sat on their butt all day. You know, we can't, we can't say that with any degree of certainty that that's going to be for sure 100% on x-ray, you're going to look like this. Um, and then that, that whole thought process also allows you to maybe get into a little bit of a mindset of like, oh, I, you know, I'm not going to do that because that's going to make my, I'm going to feel my arthritis or I'm going to make my arthritis worse. And the truth is that that's probably not accurate. So, you know, the country that has the least number um, per like population uh, for hip replacements is Asian countries. Um, so let's say like Japan. And so the reason for that is actually into their old age, they sit into that really deep squat. And if I could stand on my chair and show it well at all right now, I would do it. But, you know, they're sitting and they're, they're in that really deep squat. Their butt's just hovering inches above the ground. And they're in their 70s and 80s. And they're sitting there and they're cooking on the walk. Um, and that, so in order to create health within your joints and within, within your bones, you actually have to go through that full range of motion. So, so let's picture the hip joint, because that's the normal, or the shoulder joint, very similar in shape. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got the ball in the socket, right? Very familiar. Yeah. So you've got this whole range of motion and this whole range of motion right here. Mm -hmm. um, so if it's the hip, which to me is a little bit easier to describe this, um, people tend to stop squatting deeply once they get out of you know, any sort of athletic type environment. So maybe for you that was after you left middle school or <laughs> high school. Um, exactly. So, you know, you, you might not have ever really tried to, to squat deep, you know, unless your, your job requires it. And a lot of jobs don't. You just, you, the, the lowest you're going to go is however low the chair is going to make you go. So it's mm -hmm. probably about that 90 degree angle, right? You might go a little bit deeper to pick up some groceries off the floor, but you're sure not going real deep, okay? Mm -hmm. So the problem therein lies that um, your bones actually get nutrients by you going through that full motion, Okay, so that's how the, the nutrients get pushed into the joint surface through you doing that actual motion and going through that full motion is the only way that your whole joint is going to maintain as much structure and decrease arthritis, you know, to a point um, that you're going to 
that that's the biggest thing for you is maintain your flexibility. Um, and the Asian countries for their hips, they, they just do it. That's part of their culture. And in the United States, we go to a movie and we recline back. <laughs> Our hips are <laughs> not even near that. So, uh, and we certainly cook, we cook straight up like standing. Yes. Um, so it's, it's a completely different uh, how our, our lives are set up. But that's really the important part. You, the arthritis is going to happen. So let's say you have like it's gray hair on the inside, embrace it. Don't be upset about it. When someone tells you, you'll be like, yeah, I knew that was coming. I'm not, I'm not 13 years old anymore. Yep. Um, and But the real big thing is going through that full motion for each joint. And there's a couple of different great exercise um, kind of types that will help you do that on a regular basis. So the two that are best supported with research are Tai Chi and then also yoga. And if you think about those two different exercises, so Tai Chi, if you haven't heard about it, is um, kind of a, a slow paced um, martial art. It's not a martial art truly, but it's a slow paced movement through kind of martial arts stances. Um, and it's, it's very rhythmic, um, very methodical. Yoga, likewise, is um, slowly moving through different end range positions typically for your joints. So, you know, you'll see pictures of people in yoga poses and you're like, oh, my body just doesn't bend like that. <laughs> it doesn't bend like that because you haven't made it bend like that for years. Yeah. I guarantee you. It's just like anything else in your body. People tell me, especially guys, I've never been flexible. And I would say, well, likewise, you probably, probably haven't put any effort into stretching. Um, you know, you might have gone to the gym. You might have just cared about how much you could bench press, but you didn't really stretch. And that mm -hmm. by far is the biggest thing that will lead to um, worse um, sense, sensing of the arthritis. The arthritis is going to come. It's going to be there. 100% it's going to happen. But stretching, going through that full range, giving the joints as much ability um, to get all those nutrients as you can and staying that, uh, you know, as loose as you're able to uh, is really one of the keys. And then the strength, you know, having that muscle support and strength surrounding the joint is the other part of it. And we'll get into, like, different exercises. And there's not one exercise program that's going to help you prevent arthritis the most, but there's different exercise programs that might you might be more interested in trying um, to help you stay strong and support the joints. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tammy to talk about how inflammation can play into that idea of arthritis too, because there are components and they do have a give and a take. So they do. They do. thank you. And I do have to reiterate that stretching helps. I sustained a back injury in 1987 in a rollover car accident. And it took me probably five years of stretching before working out before I could finally squat below 90 degrees. Uh -huh. And so definitely the stretching helps. And I can say my back feels so much better knowing that I have you know, that I have the muscles stretched and the tendons moving the way that they're supposed to. So, mm -hmm. so definitely. And I've seen Tai Chi now coming out for um, older, older people in uh, yeah. retirement communities, things like that. My parents are, are doing Tai Chi and I can, I can definitely say I was the person that always said, oh, my body just doesn't do that. I'm not that flexible. And part of that is growing up with professional ballet dancers like you and my <laughs> sister who are just un in my mind were unnaturally flexible but that's because you guys stretched all the time and you still a stretch lot. all the time and yeah. so it's amazing what the human body can do when you put it under under those those stresses so great right. yeah yep all right so let's talk about inflammation so inflammation can be in a certain part of the body or it can be <laughs> systemic which arthritis is part of that systemic. Not only is it the, the wearing of the joints, which as Mandy pointed out, happens throughout your whole life, but you can increase or decrease that inflammation through various means, 
um, with exercise as well as with food. So I've mentioned before that 70% of the immune system that we have is in our GI tract, in our digestive tract. And that's because that is really the first line of defense of things that enter the body. Because if you think about it, the stomach and the digestive tract are actually on the outside of our body. Now that sounds weird, but if you think about it, everything that you put in comes from the outside. It goes in your mouth, it goes down in your esophagus, yeah. into your stomach, and then into your digestive tract. And then it comes um, out the other end through your rectum. And so it's a full tube that has complete right. um, ability to be on the outside of your body to get everything in that comes from the outside of your body. So that's one of the reasons that 70% of our immune system is in our, our GI tract because that is the first line of defense for anything coming in. And inflammation scientifically is really the response of our immune system. Anytime you get a cut, you're gonna have inflammation. We've all seen it turn red, it hurts a little bit. And that's because the immune cells in your body the neutrophils especially are there within minutes of that cut, making sure that anything that comes in is taken care of and we don't get sick. Same thing for our digestive tract. Like I said, that is where on a daily basis for someone like me who eats every two hours, on an every two hour basis, I'm taking something from the outside of my body and putting it on the inside of my body. So it has to be there. And we've talked about the fact that there are over 10 trillion bacterial cells that compose the inside and the outside of your body, which, as I mentioned before, that's a 10 to 1 ratio. They outnumber your body cells, and they're there for a reason, because we said they, they have evolved or we have evolved with them, and they chemically communicate with that immune system in our gut, that 70% of that immune system, and they will tag food items or they'll untag things and they'll say, yes, this is fine let it go, or this needs to be sequestered, this needs to be destroyed, because this is not going to be healthy for the body. Well, we have a lot of reasons that that microbiome has decreased. Part of it is food. Part of it is antibiotics. We have used, we have overused broad range antibiotics for everything. And a broad range antibiotic means it's going to kill any type of bacteria that it comes across. There's no way that it can say, okay, you have strep throat. I'm only going to kill the strep. It kills everything that is a bacteria. Well, our gut is a bacteria. You know, it contains lots of bacteria. So it's going to kill some of that as well. On the bright side, we have an appendix. And we all think of the appendix as what is called a vestigial structure. In other words, it used to do something and it doesn't anymore. But research over the last 15, 20 years has shown that the appendix actually has a function in our body and it's a reservoir for some of the bacteria in our body so that if something happens and we do reduce the number of bacteria in our gut, yeah. okay. it can release and say, oh, but we've been storing these so that we can repopulate the gut. And it doesn't store all of the species, but it stores several of the species that it can yeah. it can then help to repopulate. So luckily we have our appendix and that can help to repopulate our our gut because we do use antibiotics and sometimes we have to use antibiotics. But the other thing is the hygiene hypothesis which says that if you are too sterile in your environment mm -hmm. too sterile with, you know, 99 this kills 99.9% .9 of the bacteria. Well, a lot of the bacteria in our gut come from things that we eat, things that we experience when we're young. And it's been found that people have a more diverse microbiome that talks to their immune system better if, you know, they're sitting out in their baby carrier in the barn while mom's milking the cow and the baby cow comes over and licks your face. You know, you, you actually have you actually have a more diverse microbiome and yeah, can and I mean, can be healthy. That just makes sense. Yeah, it this is this is how we get that. So, you know, if your kids eat something, if it's not gonna hurt them, ah, let them eat it. 
you know, this is helping their, their immune system. So the one potato chip, my daughter ate off of the parking lot floor at the hospital when we got our flu shot. I shouldn't be concerned about that. Nope. Yep. Nope. I definitely, you know, if she's chewing a piece of gum you didn't give her, she's chewing a piece of gum you didn't give her as long as it's a piece of gum and, you know, not something dangerous. Usually by the time you catch her anyway, she's already swallowed what was on it. So. <laughs> Exactly. It's too late. Exactly. Exactly. So she's now got some extra, you know, some extra bacteria in her gut that are going to talk to her, yeah. her immune system. Okay. And it's going to be great. So one of the things that we have noticed through research is as the number of species drops, okay. they, and, and as the um, type of food that we eat, that a lot of things that we eat um, are made to look like food are made to taste like food. Notice I'm saying they're made, which means they're synthesized, most of them in a lab or a yeah. laboratory type situation. And they're made to look like food. They're made to taste like food. They're made for us to love them. And because of that, our, you know, the, our bacteria look at it and they go, but I don't know what that is. Okay. So if they don't know what it is, they're going to mark it as something that needs to be sequestered or destroyed. Okay. And so what's happening is we're seeing an increase in consistent chronic activity of the immune system in the gut. So the gut is completely inflamed and we're now seeing that it's spreading throughout the body. So if you've got it for a long period of time in the gut, it's going to spread through the whole body. And most diseases that we think about that we see today are, you know, a lot of it is going to be inflammation throughout yeah. the body, including arthritis. Arthritis can also be right. inflammation in those joints. So how do we increase or decrease that inflammation? And a lot of that is through diet. If we're eating things that the yeah. bacteria go, I know what that is. Yeah. I can take care of that. Yes, your body can have it. It's going to be wonderful. And then we also have to think about some of the things that we eat, like fruits and vegetables. I've mentioned fiber multiple times. Not only right. does fiber, you know, really help our gut with moving food through, with increasing the bulk of the feces, with making sure that it's not just hanging around, but we are now seeing that a decrease in fiber actually affects the bacteria in our gut. When they don't have enough of the fiber, which is cellulose from the cell walls, and they don't have enough to do, they increase the making of a chemical called butyrate. Butyrate can actually increase the risk of colorectal cancer. So the bacteria that are supposed to be helping us are getting mad at us because we're not giving them what they need, what they want. And so not only is that inflaming the bowel or the large intestine, but it's also inflaming throughout the entire body because our body is is absorbing things that the bacteria say, well, we don't know what that is, so you should sequester it. So our immune system is really working overtime a lot of the time. So thinking about what we eat can lower that. And we're seeing that with people who have arthritis or who have systemic inflammation, just by changing their diet, they're reducing that inflammation. And when they reduce that inflammation systemically, they can reduce the number of pharmaceuticals that they're on. They can yeah. increase their quality of life. If you're not on as many pharmaceuticals, you don't have as many side effects and you can actually go to Mandy and say, Hey, I need some, I need some help. I need some movement exercises. Exactly. Which is what we're going to be talking about next week. Yeah. And you know, just a, a quick last ad is, you know, arthritis, like I said, is going to happen. But you know, if you have that pain from arthritis, you need to do other things in order to decrease that pain. So we can get into the stretching. So we can get into the strengthening and it doesn't kill you to do it. You know, so changing some of the diet components that Tammy just talked about can be invaluable for decreasing that pain that you're in. Um, it, when you already feel those symptoms from the arthritis yep. that you invariably have because that's just life. But we don't want to feel that pain. You don't have to. Like, we can change it. 
we can't change your bones, but we can change what you feel. You'd be surprised. Yeah, and pain is inflammation. Pain is your yeah. immune system doing something. And that's why you feel yeah. that pain, so. Yeah, it's not always damage. It's a sign that something's not going how your body needs it to go. Exactly. So it's not a sign that you're damaging something, but we do need to take a look at what's going on. Exactly. So. All right, well, thank you for joining us and we will see you next week for some information on exercise. Yep, see ya.